This is your one-stop shop for the basics on local severe weather and severe weather safety from lightning to damaging wind, flash floods, and tornadoes. A look at how warnings are issued and what to do to stay informed and safe through the severe weather season. First, it's an overview of the types of severe weather we can get here and when it's most likely to happen. The thunderstorm season is here and with it, lightning when it strikes can damage property or worse, injure or kill those that get hit. Blinding rain falling so hard and so fast that the water can make villages and towns look like Fort Plain did last June. Strong wind can take down trees and power lines as well as damage buildings with giant hail blowing out windows, denting cars and punching holes in your vinyl siding. And sometimes these storms can also produce tornadoes. Our severe weather season runs from mid-April through September with a peak during the last two weeks in May through the first two weeks in June. In the last 20 years, there have been 22 major severe weather outbreaks during this four-week period, with a particularly high concentration of severe weather at the very end of May. Examples include the Mechanicville Stillwater Tornado in 1998, the Hillsdale Great Barrington Tornadoes in 1995, and last year's tornado which ended in Schenectady. Rotterdam. So a serious situation here coming across southern Schenectady County, Schenectady down to Carmen Niskayuna. This eventually is going to get over to Clifton Park. All of these storms occurred between May 29th and the 31st. The ground is starting to heat up quite a bit because the sun is about as high in the sky as it's going to be. and. Unfortunately, the atmosphere is still cold. There's a lag. The upper atmosphere is still cold from the winter. So this warm ground and, and this cold upper air tends to cause instability and turbulence, and the rising air tends to produce the thunderstorms around Memorial Day and the spike in severe weather at that time. And we'll sometimes get another severe weather peak towards the end of August as the first strong cold fronts originating out of Canada bring down chillier air, which collides with the summertime conditions that remain in place here. Greater clashes of air mass typically lead to stronger storms. Now for a close look at thunderstorms, how they form and what it takes for them to become severe. Thunderstorms, most are a typical garden variety type forming on hot, humid afternoons where that hot, humid air near the ground rises, forming the cumulonimbus cloud. The storm dies out when the downdraft of rain cooled air rushes out from beneath the storm, cutting off the warm, humid supply of air that caused it to form in the first place. When intense instability exists, coupled with a strong turning of the wind and increase in speed with height called shear, then there's a chance for severe weather. In the Northeast, a severe thunderstorm is defined as any thunderstorm that produces one inch diameter hail or larger and or wind gusts of 58 miles per hour or higher. And that damaging wind occurs when a storm's updraft interacts with strong wind aloft with the storm's downdraft then effectively mixing that wind down to the ground as a powerful downburst which can down trees, power lines and damage buildings. Downburst speeds can sometimes exceed 100 miles an hour. And microbursts do exactly the same thing, but on a much smaller scale with damaging wind, sometimes limited to an area as small as a neighborhood cul-de-sac. Large organized thunderstorm complexes, however, can spread damaging wind over hundreds of miles, which was the case here during the July 15, 1995 derecho. Wind damage with that event occurred in every local county with a 77 mile per hour gust clocked at Albany. Our large north-south oriented valleys such as the Schoharie, the Hudson and the Housatonic in western Massachusetts will often energize thunderstorms, enhancing their ability to produce severe weather. Storms that come from the west, as soon as they cross the river, tend to seem to, they seem to explode and become quite a bit stronger and produce more severe weather east of the river because, again, this warm, moist air that's being channeled up the valley. So this is why Saratoga, Schenectady, Washington, Rensselaer, Columbia, Dutchess, Bennington, and Berkshire counties tend to see more severe thunderstorms than other counties in the area. It's important to note that lightning plays no role in defining a severe thunderstorm, so warnings are not issued specifically for the lightning threat, only for the potential of damaging wind and large hail. But lightning is dangerous and needs to be respected. Next, a look at lightning and the common sense ways to stay safe. It can strike up to 25 miles from the base of a thunderstorm, heating a tiny channel in the atmosphere to a temperature three to five times hotter than the sun. This causes an explosion of hot gases outward and an inward rush of the surrounding cool air, which causes a shock wave that becomes the sound wave we hear as thunder. Since sound travels one mile every five seconds, if you count the number of seconds between seeing a flash and hearing the thunder, and then divide by five, you can estimate the distance to the lightning. So if you see a lightning flash and it takes five seconds to hear the thunder, that lightning strike was one mile away and means you need to get inside. The rule of thumb is if you can hear thunder, there's a chance of being struck by lightning. 
And being inside is one of the safest places you can be as long as you stay away from your electrical appliances and the plumbing. If you have a corded phone, stay off it. A strike on a nearby line can send that charge through the phone directly into you. Cordless and cell phones, however, are okay because there's nothing connecting you to the house wiring. Being in a car with the windows closed is the ultimate lightning refuge as the car's metal cage will direct any strike around you into the ground. The rubber tires on the car, however, play no role in keeping you safe. That's just an old myth. And if you're caught outside, know that open air pavilions and gazebos offer no protection and obviously don't stand next to tall solitary objects. Lightning looks for the easiest path down to the ground and it will do so through something like this tall tree. And we all know that golf clubs, metal fences, bikes, and umbrellas can attract lightning. But you may not be aware that something as small as the metal zipper on your jacket can also attract a strike. And as for heat lightning, there's no such thing. It's simply a distant lightning strike that's so far away, you don't hear the thunder. The majority of lightning that occurs is either in cloud or cloud to cloud. Only about 20% are the cloud to ground strikes, which of course are the ones that cause all the problems, with most lightning strike victims being struck indirectly, meaning the bolt hits something else then travels through objects like ground, water, etc., into a person. Thunderstorms also can produce tornadoes, and our unique terrain here has an influence on why and where we get them. Monster tornadoes like this one are very rare here, but they can happen. May 29, 1995, two of them spread destruction from Hillsdale, New York, through Great Barrington and Monterey, Massachusetts, killing three. Then a big one caused $65 million in damage in Mechanicville and Stillwater on May 31, 1998. And three years ago in nearby Springfield, this big one remained on the ground, producing widespread damage on a 39-mile continuous track across south-central Massachusetts. Tornadoes form in a warm, moist, unstable environment that's characterized by strong wind shear, which is both a turning and increase in wind speed with height. This causes horizontally spinning tubes of air to form a loft, which then get tilted vertically by the thunderstorm updraft. This then causes the thunderstorm to rotate, becoming a supercell with that rotation sometimes making it down to the ground as a tornado. Most supercells, however, don't produce tornadoes, but we have learned that the shear, the turning of the wind in the lowest half mile to a mile of the atmosphere is critical in that final stage of tornado development. We often see that shear increased in our north-south valleys like the Schoharie, the Hudson, and the Housatonic. And this also explains the spike we see in tornadoes in and near those valleys. This tornado in Florida, New York, on June 16, 2001, got some extra spin, forming where the Schoharie Valley intersects with the Mohawk, as did the Cranesville tornado on September 2011. To stay safe in a tornado warning, move to your basement. If you don't have one, the next best safest place to be is an interior bathroom or closet on the lowest floor of the building that you're in. The idea is to put as much between you and the tornado. We have a couple of hot zones for tornadoes. One of them extends from eastern Montgomery County where the Schoharie Creek intersects with the Mohawk River. That zone extends east into Schenectady, southern Saratoga, northern Rensselaer, and southern Bennington counties. The other hot zone is in the Mid-Hudson Valley. The storms come in from the Catskills. If they have rotation, they can spin up, enhancing the tornado potential across portions of eastern Ulster, Columbia, Dutchess, Berkshire, and Litchfield counties in Connecticut. National Weather Service warnings save lives when severe weather is occurring. Next is a look at how warnings are issued and some foolproof ways of getting that warning information fast. Severe weather from damaging thunderstorms, tornadoes, and flash floods can develop quickly and seemingly with little warning. The reality, however, is that lead times continue to increase from 12 to 18 minutes to up to 30 minutes on average for big events, with these warnings also much more precise than in the past. Our software now lets us issue uh, the warnings, what we call polygons, small boxes really, depending on the shape of the storm, the direction it's moving, how fast it's moving. We can issue a storm warning now that's much smaller than the county level. You see us showing these polygon warnings when we're covering severe weather, focusing on the small areas where dangerous conditions are most likely. And these smaller warning areas reduce the perception of false alarms by alerting only that segment of population in the danger zone. Now they're issuing warnings based on those small boxes. If, if you are under a thunderstorm warning, there's a good chance you're going you're gonna to see severe weather, at least see a storm. And there's lots of ways to get the warnings today, from television coverage to this, a NOAA weather radio with tone alert. Every household should have one of these, as it's still the single best way to get potentially life-saving warnings fast. And that alarm is almost guaranteed to wake you up, should severe weather happen at night.
And now your smartphone will also deliver warnings free of charge through the wireless emergency alert system. It's a partnership between FEMA, between the Weather Service, and between the uh, cellular carriers. And basically, your phone is a two-way radio. So if you are in a tornado or flash flood warning, you're going to get an alert on your smartphone. And it's the extreme events only that will trigger a warning on your smartphone, which include tornado and flash flood warnings, as well as tsunami, hurricane, and extreme wind warnings. You won't get severe thunderstorm warnings because of the frequency with which they are issued. But you will get amber alerts and presidential alerts during a national emergency. All newer smartphones, generally in the last couple of years, are configured to receive wireless emergency alerts. And throughout the severe weather season, stay on top of the weather with us here at CBS 6 for severe weather forecasts and coverage.